So uh, at this point, uh, we are shifting gears in some fairly significant way uh, towards um, policy-related matters, um, looking at uh, the Internet from the uh, perspective of uh, legal, regulatory, and policy matters. And we have a uh, star-studded cast of people to discuss their experiences and perspectives on this subject. Um, and then after uh, we have our break, um, we're going to dive into a uh, more technological view of things, specifically search and cloud computing, and then finally a look at potential future paths for the Internet. Uh, so it's my pleasure to uh, begin this morning by introducing Andrew McLaughlin. Andrew uh, is a colleague from uh, quite some time now. He spent uh, time as the chief policy officer and vice president of ICANN and then joined Google uh, in a similar role as uh, our chief policy officer. Uh, Andrew uh, has had, uh, I'm not going to go through your bio, Andrew, but uh, he's had um, perspectives uh, drawn from many different um, areas, but perhaps most important, he's done a lot of international uh, interactions. So his perspectives are uh, well beyond the domestic and therefore even more important for a global system like the Internet uh, to benefit from. Uh, his topic this morning, uh, at least according to the... Uh, chart here is the net as a platform for democracy, and I sincerely hope that it has been and will continue to be, but let's find out what Andrew has to say about that. Good morning, Andrew. <clears throat> so uh, now we move to layers uh, uh, 8, 9, and perhaps 10 um, for the next hour and a half. I retitled the talk, uh, Information is Power, So What Happens When the Network Democratizes Access to Information? And uh, I decided to go with a Star Warsian uh, narrative structure um, to uh, to talk about it. And of course, I'm um, coming up on 40, and so Star Wars to me means uh, episodes four through six, uh, not one, two, three. I don't even know how to describe that narrative arc, um, and I won't try. So here's the the the, the backdrop for the the story that I want to tell about. Um, the interaction between the network that we're all engaged in building and maintaining and um, human governance or democracy in some broad sense. Um, the backdrop is what, what I refer to as my good morning email. Um, most of you probably have like, you know, morning routines that are um, pleasurable. Uh, you know, they involve coffee or orange juice, uh, a run or something like that. My morning routine usually involves an extremely scary peek at my email to see what's come in in the last 24 hours. And it's usually something like this, uh, you know, extremely urgent, immediate priority response required or else YouTube blocked in fill in the blank. And my sort of graphical representation of my mornings <laughs> is this. Um, and so, you know, uh, from the sort of Google side of things, um, I find that we're constantly running into uh, uh, governmental opposition. Um, and what I want to do is try to explain why I think that's happening in almost every respect. When I talk about Google up here, um, I just mean the Internet. Google happens to be a, a kind of a noted avatar for the Internet these days. But the things that I'm talking about are fairly general to the network. So the narrative arc, of course, is uh, A New Hope, The Empire Strikes Back, and then Return of the Jedi. Um, the New Hope uh, is uh, you know, a broad set of trends um, and themes um, that the Internet has, uh, has been fueling um, over the last uh, 15 to 20 years. The, the most important one, of course, is democratization and decentralization of power. And this has been enabled because the cost of creating, uh, the cost of distributing, and the cost of accessing information has plummeted. Um, uh, one of the things that's peculiar about you know, working uh, for an Internet company is that you're in a declining cost business. You know, every year, a, 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 the same unit of capacity, the same unit of storage, the same unit of CPU processing power is cheaper than it was the year before. And so the, um, uh, the uh, uh, ability of the average teenager with a, a Mac laptop to create incredibly professional-looking uh, quality videos and music and, uh, uh, and text is uh, rather staggering. Um, and... Uh, the um, kind of somewhat overly uh, uh, ambitious way to describe this is, is that we're seeing a, a shift from consumption culture to creation culture. 
uh, you know, the old Apple ad from 1984 kind of captured what most people felt about uh, uh, the last hundred years. But, you know, the the medium uh, media of distribution of information went from the, you know, many, uh, the one to many mass um, uh, passive uh, uh, infantilizing uh, sort of mode to a much more interactive and creative uh, mode. And um, I think it's, you know, because we're humans, there, there, it's not like um, uh, there's not going to be a role for passive consumption of things mass produced by others. But we've seen a notable and I think quite a, an inspiring resurgence of uh, individual uh, creative expression um, enabled by, as I said, cheaper computing power, CPU processing, uh, transmission, um, and, uh, and more ubiquitous access. So I'm not going to go through all these because you're all internet people and you know what these are, but you know, to, when I talk to audiences that are not composed of internet nerds, these are the examples that I show. I try to show people about you know, DeviantArt, which is a great site that allows you to um, you know, upload your artistic creations. Other people can buy them. People can comment on them, create communities, give encouragement. Wikipedia is obviously a great example of kind of collaborative sharing uh, of information. Flickr... Um, Prosper and Kiva are two sites that I'm I'm quite high on because they uh, uh, because they enable peer-to-peer -peer lending. Um, so uh, you know individuals. Uh, Prosper, for example, um, allows somebody who has money to find somebody who wants to borrow money, um, uh, understand some basic data about what kind of a risk profile they have, and then make the loan. It's the kind of thing that in a pre-internet age would have been inconceivable at scale, um, and now it's uh, it's a business. Um, and Kiva is sort of the same thing applied to uh, micro lending, um, where um, you know people can give $100, loan it out to you know three different projects in 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 35 and then $30 units, um, and uh, uh, and and connect with uh, uh, people uh, on the other side of the planet in a way that wouldn't have been possible. Um, obviously, the internet's uh, democratizing the ability of people to speak, so you get all these awesome political blogs. Um, from the left and from the right. Um, if you want to find out what's going on in Zimbabwe, you're much li likelier to get an interesting uh, and, uh, and um, meaningful story from a blogger inside Zimbabwe than you are from the BBC Stringer based in Johannesburg. Um, and uh, 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 you know, music is something I care a lot about, and you can see just these kind of staggering productions of um, you know, uh, 19, you know, a 19-year-old sitting in a bedroom providing an curated look at, you know, an entire music scene with music files and analysis and so forth. Um, you know, online communities are a sort of another expression of this. Twitter is the sort of fad of the day. The um, Twitter uh, uh, website that I've been showing just because it amuses the hell out of me is one that gathers um, text sent over Twitter that should not have been uh, that should not have been sent. It's an amazing site, actually, to to take a look at. Uh, it's um, you know. I will now. <laughs> if Carl is coughing, it must be time to move on. Uh, you really don't. Uh, uh, and by you, I mean me. Um, you know, there's the, there are these 3D worlds uh, that, again, you know, even eight or nine years ago, given what broadband cost, given what kind of, um, you know, uh, data center costs were and so forth, it would have been inconceivable, really, to have something at the level of, uh, you know, a, a, a real-life 3D reconstruction of Dublin. Down here you can see this is a real-life exact replica of me. Um, uh, in Dublin, here you can see my real-life replica hitting on probably a you know 53-year-old guy from uh, Los Angeles. But anyway, but uh, my my point is that, uh, that my my point is that you you know you get you get a lot the, the 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 economics are driving a tremendous amount of the democratization that we've been talking about for sort of you know 15 years uh, uh more broadly to me the most exciting things uh you know in 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 the creation culture that's emerged on the net are remixes so these are people taking bits of found text um and uh uh, uh repackaging them and i think because i don't oh does this will this audio hookup work if i plug it in i'll just show you one you know a particularly enjoyable one that i've seen uh Lately, which is oops. Oh, 
on me. I didn't even want it at all. So let me just move it. So that, um, what I'm about to show you is just, you know, a couple of seconds of one of my favorite, uh, one of my favorite things out on the net right now, um, which is uh, remixes that use, um, so that, for example, you can see the, the um, for some reason, somebody thought that it would be fun to start a meme around 70s TV shows and their beginnings, but all swapped out with Star Trek and Star Wars and other images. So, you know, you can see like, like the beginning of the love boat and all the special guests are, you know, from, uh, from, from early episodes of Star Wars or Star Trek, uh, including like Carl the Cylon and of course, Charo. Um, but, uh, shall we say $1 million American dollars? Death Star plans are not in the main computer. Your mama's going on a date. Can you dig that? A date. Like a nice restaurant and some fine music. Uh, uh, this is a consular ship. We're on a diplomatic mission. Dig that? If she's going with me, she's going to have a good time. Can you dig that? Look, man, I'm in the prime of my life. Got to live the way I got to. Gonna make me some money again. I'm gonna fight. I got my turn to be the champion of the world. The Imperial Senate will not still for this. When they hear you've attacked a diplomat... Hey, look, man, I ain't fighting for no race. I ain't redeeming nobody. I quit on you when you cleared out of Detroit with Willie the Pimp. Here, yeah, you look out too busy to find your girl. You're selling my clothes, my ring, my silver brushes. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. Don't you pop me, girl. I'll pop you so you never forget it. You anyway, uh, you get the idea. The, 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 the point is... This sort of thing presents um, is 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 a is a is is a really really fun amusing um, example of the kind of uh, human creativity that's that that's being enabled by the net, and that by the way presents a very profound challenge to copyright law. So everything that we've seen up there just now is copyrighted to some big important studio. Um, uh, I don't know who owns the copyright to the old James Earl Jones movies from the 70s, but it's probably not the, uh, Lucas Films. And so by mixing these things together, you know, you end up with something which is transformatively new, but uh, uh, it is, it is uh, certainly in the view of those studios probably uh, uh, tantamount to copyright infringement. Anyway, the last uh, just thing that I want to mention in terms of creation culture is just uh, a sort of cool thing to be excited about is – um, you know, witness, which is to say people filming uh, uh, the beatings of monks in Myanmar, um, feeding, uh, filming the, the shooting of uh, uh, protesters in Tibet, um, filming um, uh, 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 police uh, misconduct in the United States or the United Kingdom. Um, we now have the ability to, you know, kind of do the citizen scale reporting that we were always very excited about. All right. So, it's not just a few nerds. Uh, it's uh, sort of the default experience for a teenager now to be able to speak to the entire world. Um, you know, when I think any of us were teenagers, uh, or at least most of us here, you know, you couldn't really get on the radio, TV, or newspapers, which were the only real mass media um, uh, media out there. Now, for you know somebody uh, in high school, they can speak to the entire world. Um, uh, potentially to, to everybody who's got a, a access to the internet, which is increasingly close to the entire world. Um, I, I will uh, just you know mention that we're democratizing knowledge about the world. There's a you know a staggering and impressive array of data that's now available um, on platforms like Google Maps. Um, you know, uh, here's a good one: uh, the Beer Hunter, um, which you know uses Google Maps to help you find uh, in uh, Toronto uh, the source of every. Uh, uh, currently open beer, wine, and liquor store uh, with their hours um, and uh, color-coded by what's open right now. So, you know, a lot of important things are being done uh, through maps mashups. Um, uh, you know, we talked about democratizing, uh, or, or I've made, sort of alluded to about democratizing democracy itself and the government's, um, uh, uh, because I think that's a pretty well-covered topic. I won't say much about it other than to say that you know, we're seeing a, um, uh, moves to utilize commodity technologies, um, commodity um, uh, computing platforms to make government more transparent, to make it more participatory, to make it more collaborative, to make it more efficient. That's a good thing. There is, of course, a dark side to all this democracy, too, which we have to acknowledge. I mean, you can look at the website of the Al-Aqsa Martyrs Brigade and see, uh, you know, glorifications of people who have uh, – 
uh, you know, blown up uh, dozens of innocent uh, uh, civilians at a pizza parlor. Um, you can see Stormfront, for example, which is a community for racists. So uh, if you, uh, you know, dislike uh, 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 blacks, Jews, or whatever, here's a community where you can find other people, talk to them, post things, and, and, uh, and feel part of a larger group. But in general, I want to say it's a basically a hopeful story about what the technology is enabling. So that's the new hope part. The empire striking back is something that I'm going to touch on just a little bit later in, in, in a little gory detail because we're a technical group and I want to talk a little bit about the technology by which this is happening. But, you know, the empire striking back touches on Google in all kinds of different ways. I just pulled out, you know, a couple of examples of things that we've experienced in the last you know, a couple of years, Google Web Search is subject to censorship in all kinds of ways, and it's not just in China. So China's the most obvious and kind of best example, but mature, sophisticated democracies, Germany, uh, France, India, Brazil, these are countries that have censorship rules and censorship regimes, and they're um, validated by a democratic process. So you can't simply say um, that... Uh, uh, you know, that the free flow of information is being blocked by nefarious governments. There are actual differences of values among cultures that we have to struggle uh, with. And when you embrace democracy, you also embrace, I think, have to embrace the idea that those values will be, will be expressed through law, through regulation, through policy. So Germany's got a unique historical experience, and its uh, uh, people have regularly revalidated a social consensus in Germany that uh, pro-Nazi speech, extreme violence, uh, glorification of war, these things are illegal and should be prohibited. They don't even care if it's effective or not. It's a form of social expression of disapproval, um, and it matters to them on that basis. We recently had a, um, a blow-up uh, in South Korea, where the South Koreans have um, uh, uh, implemented a new rule that requires real name verification for online speech. So if you want to upload a video to YouTube or you want to comment on it, their requirement would be that uh, uploaders or commenters have to go in and uh, provide and verify their real names and their national ID numbers before they can write anything or upload. And so uh, to our cultural way of thinking, this is a flamboyant violation of privacy um, uh, because it violates the notion of anonymous speech. Um, and we kind of think about privacy as being often rather synonymous with anonymity or the non-identification of yourself with things. And uh, in Korea, their logic was um, if you require everybody to be logged in uh, and use their real names, then when someone violates another person's privacy, you know who to track down and go uh, get. And it's uh, disincents people from violating each other's privacy. Anyway, there are many, many different examples that I could point to about where the empire is striking back, where those who have built their power around the control of information in the pre-internet age are trying to extend that control into the internet. So... Um, uh, from my way of thinking, there's sort of a there's an important set of commonalities among some of these big actors. Um, so if you think about uh, movie studios, uh, TV companies, uh, a state mapping agency, uh, a um, book publisher, uh, record producer, these are all institutions that have have exercised control over the distribution of information. Um, to use uh, Eric's term yesterday, they, they depend on some form of scarcity in order to make money, in part. So um, what they also have in common, by the way, is that they've traditionally had both a venture capital function and a distribution function. So think about movie studios. The venture capital function is you put money down on the table to get a movie made, um, and then you profit from it above your investment. They also had control, though, over distribution of that movie in a world of scarcity. The scarcity comes from the fact that there's only n number of movie screens in the country. There's only n number of seats uh, or, or n times whatever number of seats in front of those movie screens. If you're going to make money, the only way you can make money on your movie is to get the movie on the screen in front of the seats and have people collect money in order to go see the movie. The Internet has blown that apart. Um, but the same model applies with books, records, TV shows. You know, in TV, it's a certain number of channels, certain number of hours in the day. If you can't get your show into one of those slots, you can't make money. With records, it's you know, bin space. With books, it's shelf space. If you can't get your book on the bookshelf, you can't sell it, and you won't make any money. <clears throat> so the Internet has blown all of that wide open. It does not jeopardize the venture capital function. It just makes it a hell of a lot riskier. Um, because of the way that you could use distribution to ensure some minimal amount of revenues. I mean, even the biggest turkey films, you could plan on marketing the hell out of and getting some amount of your money back, um, uh, uh, even as you hope for a hit. So anyway, th these institutions um, uh, are trying to figure out how to um, uh, uh, maintain the control and uh, 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 
uh, that they've had over distribution. In many ways, it means they're trying to recreate scarcity on the Internet where there has been none. So to me, that's the kind of Empire Strikes Back phase. And the question, the sort of return of the Jedi question is, you know, is there a way to try to maintain the things that are great about the Internet um, uh, uh, and still um, uh, uh, meet to some acceptable degree uh, the demands of these uh, uh, threatened institutions to preserve some role for themselves in the new world. Some, by the way, just shouldn't, right? Like, so, for example, a state mapping agency in India, which under Indian law has a legal monopoly over all maps distributed in India, that just simply should not be allowed to continue. Um, there are others, however, like, uh, 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 like I think, book publishers who have performed very valuable social functions or newspapers and will continue to perform valuable social functions and for which a role uh, needs to be made. So uh, just to sort of wrap up, you know, we've got these kind of like big forces that I've mentioned already. Information is power. The Internet is democratizing access to information. Democratization is another way to say disruption. Um, the Internet is disrupting uh, these, these modes of social uh, uh, organization. Um, we're seeing a consumption culture shift to a creation culture. And the last one, which will sort of set us up for the panel, is um, we've got a borderless Internet uh, and yet a paradigm of the application of law that is very bordered. So you've got chunks of territory uh, uh, defined by lines on a map, and within those borders, a particular set of rules apply. And as I said earlier, many of them are actually democratically constituted rules that present a threat to the free flow of information that the Internet um, has. Now, if I can just say yeah, sort of a word or two about, you know, at a, at a sort of theoretical level, um, uh, it's important to think through kind of the, the sort of um, values uh, question. So what I mean by that is um, when we talk about these problems of a conflict um, over control um, as it applies to the Internet, um, what values are in play? In other words, when somebody is trying to exercise control over the Internet, what value are they trying to vindicate? And um, this is just sort of a, you know, a short list of some of the options. Um, you might be trying to uh, vindicate individual liberty in order to sort of preserve the freedom of individuals to do what they want. You might be trying to preserve a kind of ordered liberty, which is to say you preserve the freedom of individuals to do what they want up until the point at which they conflict, uh, an individual's interests conflict with those of others. Um, you might be trying to promote tolerance and coexistence. And this is actually a very interesting one. If you think about India, um, the... Uh, it, to, to massively oversimplify but maybe convey a grain of truth, the Indian conception of the state um, is a conception that's all around tolerance and coexistence, not the uh, flourishing of individual tastes and preferences uh, in an atomized kind of way. So um, uh, when Google runs across this, it's because there's a video that, for example, um, uh, paradises uh, 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 the Mahatma Gandhi. So uh, there's like a, a Gandhi striptease video. Um, and even Indians that we, you know, that, that I would find to be typically very simpatico, um, which is to say Western educated, you know, or grown up in multiple cultures or whatever, they will generally agree that um, things which offend different religions or defend, uh, offend the, the sort of um, uh, icons of the, uh, of the Indian state or society should be censored because the alternative is people killing each other. So uh, um, it's just a view that, like, why would you care about, uh, you know, um, a, a blaspheming Muhammad um, when the outcome of that could well be riots on the, uh, on the streets of Mumbai uh, in, in a week's time? And so it's just a different conception of kind of what society is about. It's not so much the vindication of the individual, but tolerance and coexistence. And so you might be trying to exercise control over the network to uh, achieve that. Um, the Chinese argument is political, social, uh, economic stability. Um, we need to exercise control over the network to maintain um, social um, cohesion and the economic growth that, that has improved their lives so much over the last 30 years. It might just be maintaining power. We need to control the network because we don't want an opposition to form and we need to stay in power. Uh, suppression of unwanted actions or beliefs or creeds or faiths. This is kind of the Germany example. Suppressing Nazi speech is, is an important value to them. Another way to think about it is the vindication of democratic judgments. You might say the network should be regulated in whatever way that the democracy and the people having voted um, or chosen their representatives uh, decides. So anyway, I list all those because I think there's this interesting question about whether the Internet itself embodies a normative value. In other words, um, we, we, we've seen this rhetoric um, over the last 20 years, really, that the Internet is in and of itself 
um, an embodiment of a conception of individual freedom, individual liberty, the right to express, the right to read, um, the right to hear, and that there's something unique about the architecture of the Internet that makes this so. And I actually think you can make a pretty good argument that, uh, um, that the way the Internet has been built, um, uh, whether you kind of use as a shorthand the end-to-end -end argument, the idea that the endpoints are the ones where um, the intelligence resides, that that embodies a notion of kind of individual autonomy and freedom um, that uh, 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 will come into conflict with cultural preferences or some of these other normative values that societies may quite legitimately decide that they're going to uh, pursue. Um, so, you know, a way to think about this is that, you know, there's a kind of like architecture point, which which John Gilmore has expressed as saying the net interprets censorship as damage and routes around it. In other words, getting packets to their destinations is the highest normative value of the Internet. Packet starts here, packet gets there, and the network's job is to deliver it. That's its its value. It is content neutral, content blind, um, but that's the normative value it embodies. Another way to think about it is sort of a, an anti-geographic point. In other words, the value of the internet is that it disrespects geography. Um, I can, uh, you know, Skype with my wife across the planet in near real time, and uh, the fundamental value of the internet is that it does not stop or slow down for national borders um, or try to instantiate local values. Um, the one I kind of like is just the idea what what the internet as an architectural matter does, and and therefore bleeding over into the, sort of the world of normative values, is uh, locates power at the edge. In other words. It's at the application uh, layer and with the endpoints of the network that real power lies. Um, and the network itself um, uh, 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 doesn't interpose itself between me and the people I want to communicate with. So, um, you know, so then if you do kind of a formula here, you've got your distributed architecture, you've got geographic ubiquity, you've got democratization of production, distribution, access. What does that, that all equal up to? Well, it equals up to, at the moment, a hell of a lot of conflict um, and a lot of fights over... Um, control over information um, and the ability of the internet uh, to um, uh, to meet it. Um, what is the proper role for governments uh, in this in this uh, formula? Well, you know, one one that you might say uh, one answer that you might give is to advance some normative value. So, if you're China, you know, your job as a government is to try to maintain social stability and to make that true on, on the internet just as it is anywhere else. I think that there's another argument that you can make, which is that the role of the governments is basically to hold the network together, so not to screw up the thing which has uh, generated so much uh, uh, creative expression, uh, uh, economic growth, and so forth, and uh, and to think about its job as making sure that the internet does not um, collapse on itself. And so you might be able to meld these two together and say, advance your normative goals, but only insofar as you're not actually threatening the ability of the internet to maintain a globally um, interconnected network. So I think I'll close there. I'll just you know note that um, uh, there is a tremendous amount of um, uh, 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 sort of pressure on Google, and I think if, if we if, if we think about the panel next as being a place where we can talk about some of these applied principles, I won't go uh, into them in detail. Let me just mention one thing. Um, whoops. Let me just collapse this. Uh, um, oops. There we go. Um, let me just mention one. Whoops. That didn't work. Well, anyway, uh, we'll focus in on China. I just want to mention, you know, one, j just a couple of sort of details about how censorship, this, this, by the way, is just a list of countries that are doing censorship um, right now. Uh, these are just the ones that I've run into in the last year. Um, and so, uh, you know, you'll note a significant number of uh, actual democracies on the list. Um, I just want to, you know, say a couple of words about what's happening in China, just because we've, you know, um, sort of touched on it in this room a little bit yesterday, and I think it's worth talking about. So, um, uh, this is an example of how a government that is seeking to vindicate a normative a set of normative values that are in conflict with the Internet uh, can go about doing it. Um, and by in conflict with, I mean jeopardizing the basic interoperable nature of the network um, <clears throat> and the principle of, of decision-making at the edges. So um, the Great Firewall, or as the Chinese uh, call it, the, the Golden Shield Project, um, uses a couple of just basic censorship techniques. Um, they do uh, straightforward IP blocking of hosts at the ISP level. Um, they do this on all kinds of different protocols. Um, they just uh, don't allow packets to uh, advance uh, toward a particular set of IP ranges. They do DNS blocking. They block uh, DNS lookups of various descriptions. Um, uh, they uh, uh, use DNS poisoning and redirection um, so that uh, they uh, uh, spoof destinations on the Internet 
and uh, 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 interrupt uh, your uh, re interrupt the flow of packets that you were intending and replacing it with something else. Um, there are a number of search-specific censorship techniques that they use. Um, they they like pay, they pay attention to the queries that are being sent to Google. Um, they uh, use packet and keyword filtering across all protocols. They use uh, the TCP reset uh, tactic, which is a particularly, from my perspective, kind of sleazy and troubling misuse of a standardized uh, 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 interaction where, um, you know, they will just uh, uh, decide that a certain number of queries from, uh, from a particular uh, subnet is unacceptable, send out uh, TCP reset packets. Um, this is a big problem at uh, universities and internet cafes where a single bad user in their, in their view um, a troubling user can lead to the entire subnet being knocked out for 30 minutes. Um, you can, of course, set your machine to ignore um, uh, reset packets, but most people don't because uh, it would not be a standard, uh, uh, standardized uh, way of behaving. Um, the administrative mechanisms are very vast and complex, and we don't have time to talk about them, but an interesting thing in China is that they really are obsessively focused on what we call the, the three Ts and the two Cs. It's Taiwan, Tibet, Tiananmen Square Massacre, the two Cs are the cult, meaning Falun Gong, or what they describe as a cult, and uh, um, uh, the uh, control of the Communist Party. So uh, uh, when you touch on one of those forbidden subjects, you will trigger one of these mechanisms of, of, of information control over the network. Um, and uh, uh, if you don't, generally speaking, they leave you alone. Um, and so either that's encouraging or that's troubling because uh, 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 it's either a pretty broad uh, set of important political topics or it's a small set of relatively unimportant things, depending on your point of view. So um, uh, uh, I just raised this because it's an interesting example of some of the standardized behaviors that we've been talking about um, can, in fact, be uh, 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 hijacked by governments that want to exercise some form of control um, for their own purposes. So um, with that, I think we should turn to uh, the panel. Uh, let me just say, by the way, there are a lot of ways to talk about these kind of control impulses, uh, child protection, privacy, um, uh, network regulation, and the open internet. The um, question of security uh, I should have put on this list. Uh, there are lots of arguments that you can bring to the table for why um, elements of control need to be built into the network. Um, but uh, uh, I think we'll talk about that in, in the panel. Thank you.